Welcome to the Worship of Pentecost 4. I'm pleased to share this televised worship with Dr. Barry Fryer. Now, Barry's nephew Michael turns 40 next Tuesday, and Michael also happens to be one of my godchildren. He's a great biker, and I'm doing three days on a bicycle out in the Lockyer Valley um, next week. Pray for me, 40 kilometres a day. Um, and in 1977, ancient history, I was the assistant curate at St Mark's in Warwick. And during the week for the early morning Eucharist, I would have this outfit on, on a bike in the freezing cold and ride to St Mark's in Warwick. And it's a great privilege to be serving God and the people of this parish now at St Mark's in the Gap. Bless you. Welcome to the Worship of Pentecost 4. As usual, we follow in the Green Prayer Book from page 119. The Lord be with you. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the great hymn of the church. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, your Son has taught us that those who give a cup of water in his name will not lose their reward. Open our hearts to the needs of your children and in all things make us obedient to your will so that in faith we may receive your gracious gift, eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 10, beginning at verse 40. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. May I speak in the name of God, abundant, generous, and compassionate. Amen. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends us flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. When you want to talk, he'll listen. He could live anywhere in the universe, but he chose your heart. A tourist visiting Italy came upon a construction site. What are you doing, he asked the stonemasons. I'm cutting the stone, answered the first. The second said, I'm cutting stone for 1,000 lira a day. And the third said, I'm helping to build a cathedral. One of the amazing attributes of the great God we serve is the meticulous way in which he has laid his plans and mapped his strategy for the universe, particularly for the earth and the people he has placed on it. There is nothing haphazard about God's planning, nothing left to chance. A beautiful demonstration of this is the way our Lord Jesus Christ laid out his plans for the establishment and the growth of his kingdom. If Jesus has planned so carefully and outlined so explicitly, it is imperative that the church implement its role in this worldwide endeavour as God has made it clear in his word. Every commission that Jesus left for the church has been given to individuals and not to the church as an institution. It is far more comfortable for people to get lost in the crowd to seek anonymity. But Jesus has singled out individuals in his commission to preach the gospel to every creature. The picture is that of an army moving forward under the orders of the captain. The writer of Hebrews refers to Jesus as the captain of our salvation. In fact, the militant concept of the church is found throughout the New Testament. It is possible, therefore, to outline the doctrine of missions within this context. Let us see, first, that Jesus indeed is the captain of our salvation and he has issued orders. Just before Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives, leaving behind a wandering group of disciples, he said to them, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Before his disciples were to go out to preach and witness, it was necessary that they tarry or wait for a season. 
the New English Bible maintains the militancy in Christ's command. Until you are armed with power from above. The result of their waiting was the coming of the Holy Spirit, the infusion of God's presence into their total beings. The Holy Spirit's presence within them brought about a wonderful change. The fearful hesitancy with which they had faced life after Jesus' crucifixion became a fearless courage to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ. Episcopal priest Robert Capon writes, The critical issue today is dullness. We've lost our astonishment. The good news is no longer good news. It's okay news. Christianity is no longer life-changing. It is life-enhancing. Jesus doesn't change people into wide-eyed radicals anymore. He changes them into nice people. If Christianity is simply about being nice, I'm not interested. It is about a radical relationship. When believers are possessed by the Spirit of God, they have available the power to perform the task God has for them to do and the spiritual sensitivity to discern where and what the tasks are. It is an insult to God and a grief to his spirit when we go about his work haphazardly and unprepared. We are to tarry until we are armed with his power and then we are to be at the ready, to go and to do as we are impressed by his Spirit. Not only has Jesus issued orders, he has also provided the equipment for his marching army. What is this equipment? The first and foremost weapon we wield is the Word called in Scripture in Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit. Paul gives us the picture of the Christian's armour in Ephesians 6 and he is careful to specify that our weapon is the sword of the Spirit. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that it's a two-edged sword which cuts asunder both to the dividing of bone and marrow and of soul and spirit. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, the weapon Jesus used with expertise was not his personality as the Son of God or his perfect sinless humanity, but the Word of God. In answer to each of these temptations from Satan, Jesus said, It is written. With all the assurance of his soul, Paul could say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Recently, I had a time with a friend who is dying and has been a committed Christian all her life. And I said, who do you want to take your funeral? She said, well, you, of course. And I said, okay. I said, how do you feel about dying? And she said, 
she squirmed around like all of us do and we can all be aware of our failings and sins and I tried to help this dear person to see that it's putting our trust in the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we've all mucked up in some way. The scripture is very um, clear. All people sin and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter who you are. But when it comes to dying, we need to completely trust in what he has done for us and, and live into that. And there's that lovely old story about um, arriving at the gates of heaven and P St Peter says, why should you come in here? And there's all sorts of answers that can be given. But really the best pastoral theological answer is because Christ died for me. Full stop. You know, God loves us. He loves us as we are. He's redeemed us. He calls us by name. And when this earthly life is over, and gosh, it's over so, so quickly. I, I used to think when I was young, oh, that poor old person, 70 or 80, and when you get to that point, you sort of change, you, you range on things. And and one day we're all going to die and if, if we're close with Jesus Christ and trusting him, there's absolutely nothing to fear. It's putting our trust in all that he has done for us and, and just allowing him uh, to carry us through that final surrender of life in the experience of death. The other major weapon for the Christian soldier is prayer. Christians sing about prayer, teach lessons about prayer, but most of the time there is a deafening silence between God's people and his throne of grace because we've become so prayerless. We're so busy, even engaged in religious activity, that we do not take time to pray. And the paradox of it all is that it is through prayer that we're able to learn to use the sword of the Spirit. One, one old preacher once said, all word you dry up, all spirit you blow up, but with both you grow up. And the church of St Mark is here to help people grow into maturity in their relationship with the living person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone's welcome the whole mess of humanity and people one by one should find here love, forgiveness, grace, mercy and redemption. Prayer is the key that releases understanding and discernment concerning what God would say to us through his holy word. Then as we study God's word, we are able to see ourselves in the light of the word and discipline ourselves so that we are instantly and momentarily available for God's use. And incidentally, we are not to do all the talking in prayer. One of the most amazing experiences a Christian can have is learning, and this takes something in our sort of culture, is learning to be still before the living person of God and listen to God with the ears of the Spirit. Finally, not only 
does Jesus issue orders that we are to follow and provide the equipment to carry out these orders, he also supplies the motivation for service. The greatest motivation of all is God's love. We cannot understand the love of God. There is no way we can ferret out the reason why a perfect and holy God expresses such compassion towards us, his creatures, who, if we're honest, are basically evil and contaminated with sin. I like people who have been ruined by Jesus. Their souls have been permanently scarred by God's love. This means intimacy. And another way to say that word is into me see. We need a fresh baptism of death to ourselves and life to God. We need to be kissed afresh in this hour. We can pray, unravel us, Lord, the tightest of us. Find a resting place in us. Deliver us from taking ourselves so seriously and you so lightly. Lord, awaken love in this hour, a love that is totally about you in the deepest part of our being, that we might worship, love and adore you. Speak living truth into our inward parts and make us agreeable to you. Many of us, like I do, carry the tension of living across our shoulders and we often get tight and uptight there. And when I do a spin class in the gym on a stationary bike, the instructor is always saying, relax your shoulders, tighten your tummy muscles. And, and about ourselves and in our relationship with God, we need to relax and and tighten up other parts and, and be available for what God wants. So the love of Christ is our motivation. Listen to what Paul says. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What is Paul saying? Simply that it is the amazing love of Christ, so beautifully demonstrated in his life and death, that thrusts him forward to serve his Lord at any cost. And Paul paid all sorts of difficult costs in his ministry. Finally, people need, combined with the love of God and Christ, to be motivated to carry out his mission until he comes. Paul writes, There's no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And Paul goes on to describe the terrible need of sinful humans. Many are in spiritual need. Time is precious and opportunities are fleeting. In one parish where I served, I was opening the mail one day and I'd been away somewhere in Tasmania and I came back to a week of mail and out of one envelope 
fell a check for the parish for one million dollars. Now that parish was very seriously challenged financially and one generous person saw the need of that parish and gave that amount of money with, with no restrictions, no guidance, just given for the ministry of that parish. So I encourage you as you are able to be generous to the ministry of St Mark through COVID, through all the things that are changing and to prepare this parish for the new ministry and the new priests that eventually um, will come here and that needs finances committed behind it to enable the work of the gospel to go on in this area of the city. Let us pray. Father, thank you for loving us through your Son at great cost. Thank you for the incredible gift of the Holy Spirit into each of our lives through baptism and confirmation. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit into the community of believers here in St Mark's the Gap. Lord, encourage us to live in your word, to be open to your spirit, to be generous givers and, and to see this parish flourish and grow and bring in your kingdom for Jesus' sake. Amen. We join together in the shortened creed which you find on page 171. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. Almighty God and Father, your Son Jesus Christ has promised that when we ask in faith, you will receive our prayers. We give thanks for your great love, which you bestow on us undeservedly, forgetting our sins when we earnestly repent, cleaning our plates with forgiveness. We pray that you will continue to guide us in your ways. We give thanks for those leaders who have led well during the COVID pandemic and pray that others might follow their lead. We give you thanks for those who have recovered and for the skill and compassion of those who bravely confront the disease with their help. We pray for those who are unable to understand the threat. And we pray also for those affected economically by lockdown. Endow with compassion those charged with the unenviable task of reconstruction. We pray for the church throughout the world and especially give thanks for those in Australia who lead wisely. We pray for Philip, our Archbishop, for our regional Bishop, Jeremy, for Bruce, our locum, who so generously offers his services, for Alan, Ken and Desley, and all those who volunteer their services in the parish. We pray for those in government, that they may be guided by your teachings, Lord, and that they respect the natural world which you have provided so abundantly for us, that we may all nurture and not destroy that world. We pray for all who are suffering from illness and especially for those made refugees by war and tyranny. 
We prayed for all who are persecuted in your name. We give thanks for all your saints in every age, and in particular remember John the Baptist at this time as we celebrate his birth. As our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And we continue to pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, our divisions, and our confusions, but grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live for ever and ever. Amen. This may be for some time the last televised service as we go back to public worship in this church of St Mark's next Wednesday with Holy Communion at 9.30 and I think you have to book in if you're coming and, and you do that with Trish in the office and then we have return to 7.30 worship and 9.30 worship on July the 5th. So it'll be nice to see all these people I talk to through a camera um, in the flesh in this place and very much look forward to the community returning together. And if I can be of any help to you in any way, um, my mobile and email appear eventually and the hymn that we're singing today is Who Would True Valour See? And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love this day and always. Amen.